Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to, I guess this is our third week already. Uh, after tonight, I guess we will be officially one half of the way through the course, if you can believe that. So the six-week courses, you'll kind of get used to the pacing of them, but they do go by very, very quickly. You know, six weeks is, is not a whole heck of a lot of time, but we are still able to cover all the material that we would normally cover in an eight or a 16-week term. So uh, you will you will get used to it, and after a couple of courses, it'll it'll seem very comfortable and very natural for you. But um, after tonight, we are halfway through, and since we are almost halfway through, it's probably a good time for us to talk a bit about this midterm assessment. And I made the midterm assessment available on our Canvas site, so I did that I believe on Sunday. So it's been up there for a couple of days. The midterm assessment is due by midnight on February 26th, so you've got almost two weeks to work on it. And as we had discussed in our first night of class with this midterm assessment, it is what we would consider to be an open book type of assignment in that you can use all the information that you have gained throughout the course. It is designed to be very much of an assessment as opposed to a traditional type of examination or some type of a research assignment. This is truly meant to be an assessment of what you have learned in the course and how well you are able to take this information and then apply it appropriately in some real life types of public sector scenarios. So that's how the entire uh, assessment is designed. So therefore you can use information from our Wednesday evening sessions. You can use information from the Don Kettle textbook, information from the classics articles that we read out of the Shafritz textbook, um, any you know, information you glean from the Canvas essays, uh, you can use that information as well. So all that information is, is fair game. Now, since this is not a research assignment, you don't have to worry about pulling in outside resources to answer these questions. That is not necessary. What I'm looking for is for you to use the information from the class in order to respond to these questions. So you don't have to worry about outside research. You don't have to worry about citations for outside sources. Uh, none of that is, is important here for this midterm assessment. What I'm looking at with the midterm assessment is I am looking at, again, your ability to take information from the course and then apply it appropriately in given situations. Therefore, there are no best answers to the midterm assessments. There are no necessarily right or wrong answers. There are answers that are appropriate. There are some answers that may not be completely appropriate to the scenario, but hopefully you'll find those answers that are appropriate and then justify to me why those answers are appropriate. As with everything else that we do in this course and really in the entire MPA program, we really have this focus on parsimony. We want to be as concise as we can possibly be when we are writing these essays, when we're answering these questions. So a good rule of thumb in terms of the length of your answers on the midterm assessment, you know, one to two paragraphs, I think is certainly good enough to suffice for each one of the questions on the midterm. So you don't have to worry about writing a thesis. Uh, just one or two paragraphs will usually get the job done. So on the first night of class, we talked about these assessments as consisting of five scenarios with two questions related to each of those five scenarios. So there are five scenarios on the midterm, a grand total of 10 questions, each scenario worth 20 points, therefore each question worth 10 points. So I will be grading it based upon your justification for why your answer is appropriate to address the scenario. And I always think it's instructive, even though it takes up a little bit of class time, it's instructive for us as a class to sit down and take a look at the scenarios on the midterm assessment to make sure that everyone is familiar with the types of questions that are being asked and the type of information that you'll need to use in order to respond to these questions. I always find it good for us to do this in class as a group, and then that kind of eliminates a lot of the questions down the road as you spend the next couple of weeks working on the assessment. So let me go ahead and walk through each of the five scenarios and the questions related to each scenario and talk about what type of information I am looking for for each one of these scenarios. So basically each scenario is going to refer back to a general topic that we've discussed in the class. 
So the first scenario goes back to that discussion we had about the constitutional basis of public administration. So in this first scenario, as discussed in class, the Constitution received ratification from the requisite number of states relatively quickly. However, New York was slow to ratify. The goal of developing the Bill of Rights and writing the Federalist Papers was to convince the citizens of New York and the Anti-Federalists to support the new Constitution. The work we currently do as public administrators is effect, directly affected by the liberties and the freedoms incorporated in this Bill of Rights. So in question 1A, I'm asking that you select three of the freedoms, three of those liberties that are discussed in the Bill of Rights and discuss how these freedoms may affect the work of public administrators. So the three freedoms you select completely up to you, you know, you can do freedom of speech or freedom of press or you know, freedom of, of religion or any of those uh, freedoms that are spelled out in the 10 amendments, in the first 10 amendments, the Bill of Rights, that you would like to discuss and that you feel will have an impact upon the work in general of public administrators. And then in question 1B, Madison made a compelling argument for the new Constitution in Federalist Paper number 39. When we talked about the constitutional basis of public administration, we spent a good bit of time talking about Federalist Paper 10 and Federalist 39. When we talked about Federalist Paper number 39, we said that what Madison did is he took the Constitution and he deconstructed it into its component elements for the purpose of asking the question, is the Constitution national in nature or is it federal in nature? And as he went through and deconstructed the Constitution, he made multiple arguments. So please select and discuss three of the arguments made by Madison in Federalist Number 39 to convince Anti-Federalists to support the new Constitution. So of all those arguments he makes, select three of those arguments and discuss those three arguments that he made to try and get people to support the new Constitution. So scenario number one, constitutional basis of public administration. And again, one to two paragraphs, certainly sufficient for each of those questions. Scenario number two then turns our attention to accountability and ethics. The city of South Terra Verde is a quickly growing community adjacent to a large metropolitan area. South Terra Verde has decided to construct a large public park in the center of town to accommodate the recreation needs of its growing population. The city council has been discussing this issue for the past two months and plans to discuss the purchase of land for this park again at their next council meeting with a possible vote on the purchase also scheduled for that meeting. Council member Hayes recently, as of last week, purchased a tract of land within the area for the proposed city park. Council member Hayes plans to participate in the discussion and to vote on the city's purchase of the land for the park. 2A, if Mr. Hayes participates in the discussion and votes on the proposed land purchase, what principles in the ASPA Code of Ethics would this potentially violate and why? And then 2B, are you concerned about Mr. Hayes' purchase of the land? Why or why not? So this is our accountability and ethics scenario where you will once again, as you've done before, look at the ASPA Code of Ethics and those eight principles and then identify which of those principles you think would potentially be violated if Council Member Hayes decides to participate in the discussion and to also then vote on this proposed land purchase. So this kind of is, you know, is a close corollary to what we talked about with George Washington Plunkett and his recollections of his time in Tammany Hall. Uh, we kind of gave that example that he provided of a, a similar type of situation. Scenario number three then moves into some of the information that we will be discussing in class this evening. And that information deals with public versus private sectors and the differences and similarities between the two types of organizations. The Midtown Unified School District has seen its population increase by 40% over the past two years. This growth is forecasted to continue for the next 10 years due to development within the district's jurisdiction. Faced with this exponential growth in student population, the district needs to construct new schools quickly. 
the district decides to construct a school on the east side of the city by funding the school with bonds. And we haven't talked a lot about municipal bonds yet, but as many of you probably already know, whenever a local government wants to construct a capital project that has a long lifespan, so a new city hall or a new school or a new fire station, a building that's going to serve multiple future generations, they oftentimes like to do that through the borrowing of money. If they were going to just raise their tax rates in year one in order to construct this building, that tax rate increase would be cost prohibitive for residents in the city. So instead they issue a bond, they issue that bond, investors then purchase that bond, the proceeds that come in from investors purchasing that bond, those bond proceeds are then captured and used for the construction of this facility. So the district decides we're gonna issue bonds, we're gonna borrow money in order to build the school. The construction costs for this school are estimated to be $65 million, and construction should take about 18 months. Uh, $65 million is a little bit on the low end for a school with an occupancy of about 1,000 students. About 12 years ago, my district, we built a two-story school that accommodates 1,000 students. At that time, it was $55 million. And so now with cost escalation, the $65 million figure is probably a little bit optimistic, but it will cost $65 million and will take 18 months to complete. The district also entered into an agreement with a developer to construct another school on the western edge of the city. This school will be completely built by the developer with little to no district interaction. This school will be identical to the school to the east, be identical to the one that the district is building, but is estimated to cost $45 million and to take 12 months to complete. This is very common in areas where you have some fast development and some quick growth going on in that school districts and cities and even counties will enter into mitigation agreements with those developers. Because as those developers build those homes and families move into their homes, then you're going to have an increased population that will then put a strain on the existing infrastructure, whether that infrastructure be a school or be a, a fire station or a library. And so therefore the district in this case enters into a mitigation agreement with the developer and for the privilege of being able to develop this community and build these and sell these houses, the developer agrees to construct a school for the students that will then be generated through those new housing units. So you've got one school that's being built on the eastern side of the city that's being done by the school district, and one that's being built on the western side of the city that is being built by the developer. Both of those schools, those blueprints are identical. So they're gonna be identical schools. They're gonna be mirror images of each other. Question 3A, what explains the discrepancy in the time to completion and the cost between the two schools? And tonight we will talk about some of the differences in terms of contracting out and the RFP process and why sometimes it is what takes longer and sometimes a little bit less efficient for the public sector as compared to the private sector. And then 3B, what are some of the disadvantages to allowing a private sector developer to construct the school on the west side of the city? So this gets at those differences, those inherent differences between public and private administration. And one of the examples I oftentimes use in class is an example of the renovation of the ice rink in Central Park in New York City uh, back in the 1980s. And the city of New York wanted to renovate the, the ice rink in Central Park. And they have been for years trying to renovate it. And they were running over budget. And the project was not getting done in time. And so finally, the city turned to a private sector developer. And that developer happened to be named Donald Trump long before he ever became president. And Donald Trump then took over the development, the redevelopment of this ice rink and was able to get it done quicker and was able to get it done cheaper than what it would have cost the city. And the primary reason for that is that Trump organization, the Trump construction firm, did not have to abide by the same types of competitive bidding requirements that New York City did. 
So New York City had to put out a request for proposals. Then bidders would submit sealed bids in a competitive bidding process. The city would then open up these bids and then they will award the bid to the lowest, what's called responsive and responsible bidder. A responsive bidder is some a bid that addresses all the parts of this request for a proposal. So if the bid addresses everything that's supposed to be in that project, then it's considered to be a, a responsive type of proposal, a responsive type of bid. Responsible means that the bidder is fiscally responsible. Here in California, that would mean that the bidder is bonded and that the bidder is registered with the DIR, which is the Department of Industrial Relations here in California. And not only does the contractor have to be registered with the DIR, but all the subcontractors that are included in that bid, all those subcontractors also have to be bonded and also have to be registered with the DIR. Uh, if so, then you've got what's considered to be a fiscally responsive proposal from a fiscally responsive bidder. You have now uh, met the requirements of responsiveness as well as responsibility. Sometimes we've run into situations where we have awarded a bid to the lowest bidder, and then one of the contractors that did not get awarded the bid will then file a bid protest. And they will say, well, you awarded this bid to the lowest bidder, but the reason why they were the lowest bidder is because their bid was not responsive to all the elements of the request for proposals. Or one very common bid, proposal, bid protest basis is they'll say, well, that contractor, even though that contractor is bonded and registered with the DIR, the subcontractors that they're using for things like cement work and plumbing work, those subcontractors did not have a DIR registration. And if that's the case, then they are correct. And then that bid would have to be thrown out. You'd have to go back and do a rebidding type of process. That's kind of the way in which bidding happens, especially here in California under a public contract code. So it really does slow down the process. There are a lot more hoops, if you will, that the public sector has to jump through. And you know that's, that's kind of one of those examples here in scenario number three. Scenario number four, this one gets at some more information that we will cover near the end of class tonight. It really gets at this idea of the politics administration dichotomy and the idea of public administration as a discipline. As we know, Woodrow Wilson's classic article, The Study of Administration, and you're, you're assigned to read that for next week, formed the basis for a separate field of the study of administration. One of the enduring concepts that emerged from the article was the idea of a politics administration dichotomy. For A, describe Wilson's argument for why we need a separate study of public administration. And then for B, describe the politics administration dichotomy and why this dichotomy is no longer as valid as it once may have been. And in class tonight, near the end of class tonight, we will go through Wilson's article to kind of foreshadow it for you. So you'll then be reading it for next week. And we'll talk about the politics administration dichotomy. And we'll talk about some of the flaws inherent within that politics administration dichotomy. So by the end of class tonight, you will have all the information that you need in order to successfully respond to scenarios one, two, three, and four. So the first four scenarios should have all the information once we're done with class tonight. The information for scenario number five, you will get in next week's class. The Department of Housing in the city of Tyler Heights is a large old organization in the state of New Mexico. Its primary function is to make adequate and affordable housing available to income eligible residents in the city. As an older organization, the Department of Housing has developed an extensive set of policies and procedures. Employees are held accountable and evaluated based upon how closely they adhere to these policies and procedures. Employee turnover is high as employees feel that they are not valued and have few opportunities to develop their skills through training. There is little vertical and horizontal communication occurring within the organization. Question 5A, select two classical organization theorists or theories that you feel would benefit the organization. Discuss these theories and why they would benefit the organization. 
Next week, I will take you through the evolution development of the theoretical perspectives in public administration, focusing primarily on organizational theories. We'll start in the late 1800s with the classical school with people like Max Weber and Frederick Taylor and Luther Gullig and Henri Fail. And we'll talk about those classical approaches and what kind of ties all those classical approaches together, uh, some of the differences between those classical approaches. So for 5A, you'll be selecting two of those theories that we discuss in class next week, classical theories that you think could benefit the organization and why. Then also next week, we will talk about what we call the neoclassical schools of thought. Neoclassical schools of thought are things such as the human relations school, the school of human resource management, the school of systems theory, the school of organization culture, and some of these more modern theories in public administration. So for 5B, you'll select two of those neoclassical theories or theorists that you feel would benefit the organization and then discuss why you believe those theories would be beneficial. So the information for number five, you will get in class next week. So by the end of class next week, you'll have all the information that you need in order to answer all five of the scenarios on the assessment. Again, you don't have to do outside research, don't have to use any outside citations, just use the information you've acquired in the class in order to provide one or two paragraph answers to each one of those questions. Now that one or two paragraph rule of thumb, that it's just that, it's just a rule of thumb. If you need to use more than two paragraphs to answer the question, that's absolutely fine as well. I'm not gonna stop reading after two paragraphs, uh, but, but do try and be as concise and parsimonious as you can be. The way in which I'll evaluate the assessment is, again, based upon your ability to justify why your answers are appropriate for those scenarios. And what I will do is I will put my feedback in the feedback box in the grading area so that whenever you click on your grade, you'll see that uh, the feedback box will pop up. And then I will put in, if you missed any points on any of the scenarios, I will provide a justification for why those points were deducted. I will never remove points from you without telling you why those points are being deducted. Uh, so that will all be provided a feedback in that feedback box, and then the grade will then be provided in the box above that. So this is due by midnight on February 26th. Um, I don't know how quickly I will get them graded. I usually like to turn things around, certainly within 24 hours. But that is the week that I am chairing an accreditation site visit to another Cal State in Northern California. So I will be leaving the next day on the 27th to go and chair that site visit. So not sure if I'm going to be able to grade those immediately. They may have to wait till the site visit is over on March 1st, but we'll kind of play it by ear and see how things go. You can always turn things in early. And so if you get your midterm assessment done before the 26th, you're always welcome to go ahead and turn it in early. And let me go ahead and show you, if you haven't accessed it yet, where you can access the midterm assessment at and then how you can submit it. So let me just share out my entire screen. It's probably easier to do. And sorry, I closed up my chat. So um, in terms of the uh, citing textbooks and readings, uh, yeah, if you're if you're going to use like information from Bram Allison, you know, for for number three, then you know if you see you know Allison parentheses 1980 said blah 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 blah, uh, then yeah, usually you would then provide a citation for that. Or if you see you know Kettle, you know 2021 says da da da, then you provide a citation for that. But you don't have to provide citations for any resources outside of what we're using here in the course. So that's a very good question. Okay, let me stop this share. Let me go back in here. All right, let's try this again. Let's go and share out the screen and well, hmm. Okay, that's disturbing. Let me just go ahead and close the whole exam and let's try this one more time. Okay, sharing the screen. Okay. And oops, we're getting there. 
Okay, let's go into our class and I'll show you if you haven't seen it yet where you can find the midterm. I go into student view. Hopefully you can see our Canvas site there. Uh, if you click on modules and then once you're in the modules, you just scroll down to week number four and you'll see midterm assessment due by February 26th. You click on that link that will then open up where you can download the assessment. So this is the file here. You click on the arrow, you can then download it to your computer. And then I do recommend it's probably easier for you to just put your answers directly into that Word file. So for question 1A, below question 1A, just go ahead and put your answers in there. For 1B, put your answers below 1B. A lot of people like to put their answers in a different color font just to make it um, stand out a little bit from the questions. And so some people use red font, some use a, a blue color, you know, whatever you're comfortable with is fine. But just enter your answers directly into that Word file. Then you can save it. I don't have any preordained saving conventions in sort terms of what you name the file. Some of your instructors, as you move through the MPA program, will be that specific and tell you exactly what the naming convention is. I don't do that. So you can name the file, whatever you'd like to name it. And then all you have to do is when you're ready to submit, just click upload and you can then attach the file, submit it, and then it'll go directly into the assignment Dropbox. The nice thing about this in Canvas is that whenever you submit an assignment, it then on my main screen pops up as a to-do item. I can just click right on it, review your exam, provide feedback in the feedback box as well as a grade, hit submit, and then that grade will then automatically populate into the gradebook area. So that is where you will locate the midterm assessment. Okay. All right. Um, Question by Chris and Texia and citations need to be in APA format. Yes. All the citations we use in the program all need to be done in APA format. That is correct. And that's something that holds true not just for this class, but for all your future courses in the DL MPA program as well. So that is due on February 26. Uh, do you want the file upload as a Word or PDF? Um, your know, Word is preferable. So if you can do it as Word, that would be great. If you do it as PDF, I can still review it. I can still add comments, but um, Word usually works a little bit better. Then in addition to the midterm assessment that's due on February 26, then you also have Canvas essay number three that's also due on February 26 as well. So you don't have a Canvas essay due next week, your next Canvas essay number three is due the following week on February 26. But as always, you can go into your Canvas essay early if you like. Uh, the discussion board prompt is already there. And for Canvas essay number three, you will be taking information that we covered tonight on public and private sector similarities and differences. And you will be taking a public organization and then comparing it to a private organization, two similarities and two differences between a public organization that you choose and a private organization. If you are currently in the private sector, you just reverse the logic and you will take a private, your private organization or a private organization you're interested in, and then two similarities and two differences between that and a public organization. If you're in a nonprofit organization, then two similarities and differences between a nonprofit organization and either a government organization or a private sector organization. You can kind of pick which organization you want to focus on. You do not have to use your own organization. I know that sometimes it's a little, it gets a little touchy and a little awkward when you're talking about things within your own organization in a public forum. I certainly understand that. So you do not have to use your own organization. You can use any organization you're familiar with or any organization that you are interested in. Uh, I've looked at the responses from Canvas essay number one and Canvas essay number two. They've all been very good. You're doing exactly what you should be doing. And so just kind of replicate what you've been doing so far in the Canvas essays for Canvas essay number three, and then everything should be very good. So 26, Canvas essay number three, and then the midterm assessment. As you work on the midterm assessment, if any questions pop up, feel free to shoot me an email and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Um, I'm doing some traveling over the next couple of weeks. And so next week I'm going to DC for several days. 
come back home and then a day later I'm going to Northern California for this accreditation site visit. So between uh, next week and March 2nd, I'm gonna be kind of on the road a lot, but I'll still certainly have access to my email and be able to answer any questions that you may have. Okay. Any other general questions at this point in time about the midterm assessment or anything at all? Okay. If not, then I promised you last week that we would do breakout groups this week, and that's what we're going to do. And so we'll start out our session tonight uh, by breaking you up into groups. And as I foreshadowed last week, what I'd like each group to do is I'd like each group to think about and settle on some ethical issue, some situation where there was an ethical violation. And again, it doesn't have to be your organization, but just something you're familiar with, an ethical violation, and then talk about what principles in the ASPA code of conduct you think your group feels were violated in this ethical violation, in this ethical or unethical example. Uh, so for each of the groups, I'm gonna go ahead and set up the groups in just a second here, but for each group, I would like the first thing for each group to do is to select a spokesperson because once we get done working in groups, we will reconvene as a class and then each spokesperson for each group will then share out what your groups came up with. So we have what, 17 people here right now. So let's see, let me create some groups. Um, it probably makes sense with 17 folks to go ahead and create three groups. So I'll create three groups and then people will be randomly assigned. So. I've gone ahead and created the group. So room number one has six, room number two has six, and room number three has five. So again, once I release you into the groups, each group should identify and come to an agreement on an ethical violation, an example of an ethical violation, and then discuss which of the ASPA code of ethics, which of those principles were violated by that ethical example. Make sense? Okay. I think what we'll do is we usually spend about half an hour or so working on this in groups. So I'm going to open up the rooms. You'll go into your room, assigned room, spend about half an hour working on this. I will give you a little countdown. And so when there's five minutes left, I'll broadcast all the groups, let you know five minutes remaining. I'll give you a two minute warning. And then when I close the rooms, you then have a minute to finish up what you're doing and then uh, leave the room and you'll be automatically put back into the main classroom. And at that point in time, we'll then reconvene and see what each of the groups came up with. So I'm gonna open up the rooms. Rooms are open, so feel free to go to your assigned room and have fun. Max Weber is an interesting guy because Max Weber really did believe that organizations were the highest level of rationality. And he thought if we had these formal organizations that wrote down all their procedures, uh, that they would be a very rational type of decision-making process. So instead of making decisions just because of what we believe or what we feel, we make decisions based upon the collection and the analysis of information, of hard evidence. That's what makes something rational, that we're making decisions based upon evidence that we have collected. So they're formal, they are rational, and they are systems of relationships among people, administrators, who are vested with administrative authority. That's important. They have this administrative authority, which means that they have this legal basis for what they are doing. Public organizations are created out of enabling legislation. That enabling legislation comes directly out of legislative organizations. Therefore, it has force of law. Private corporations do not share that same level of force of law in the way in which they are created. So you've got this administrative authority bestowed upon administrators from government code, from laws, from legislative bodies. This administrative authority that they have, they then utilize those resources and that authority to carry out public programs. Now, this is where the definition gets a little messy because we have to kind of distinguish between 
what is a public program, what is a public good or service versus what is considered a private good or a private service. And so this kind of introduces a discussion of the differences between public and private goods. For public goods, we would assume that the provision and production of those goods will be done by public organizations. So those are the types of things that we study in the field of public administration. Private goods, we would assume the provision and production of those private goods will then be left to private organizations, to private corporations in the private sector. Well, what then is this difference between provision and production? They are similar terms, they are related, but they are not the same. Provision is when you give or provide the resources that will then make the production process possible. So for the, the DLMPA program, the provisions, the resources are coming from the, the fee structure that you are paying or that your employer is paying, uh, some of the, the um, support that's kicked in from CPACE. Those are the resources that then make the production of MPA education possible. And the production of the MPA education is what happens here tonight and what happens in all the courses that you'll be taking in the deal MPA program. So provision is giving the resources, production is actually creating the good or the service or actually implementing that program. So if we're looking at a pure private good, we would anticipate seeing private provision and private production. So you think about something like a Three Musketeers bar, not to advertise one type of candy bar, but a Three Musketeers bar. That is what we consider to be a pure private good. It is made, it is, the candy bar is created with private sector resources, the money that comes into that corporation from the profits, from sales of other candy bars. And so they're private resources. The production process is a private factory that is then creating this candy bar. Now, admittedly, there can be government regulation over that production process. We want to make sure that the workplace is safe for workers. We want to make sure workers are not being exploited. We want to make sure that that company is not polluting a river, uh, creating some of those negative consequences. We want to make sure that the um, candy bar itself is safe so that people can consume it without getting sick. So there are government regulations, but for the most part, it's a purely private provision and production type of process. Private goods, pure private goods like the candy bar, demonstrate the characteristics of excludability and exhaustibility. That you can exclude people. So if you don't pay the price of that candy bar, you don't get to consume the candy bar. So you can exclude people from pure private goods. Those pure private goods are also exhaustible. So if there's one candy bar on the shelf, two customers go in, the person who gets there first, who has the money to pay for it, gets to consume that candy bar. Once that sole candy bar is consumed, then there's not another candy bar on the shelf for the other person to consume. That resource has been exhausted. So pure private goods are both excludable as well as exhaustible. Then on the opposite end of the spectrum, you have what we consider to be the more pure public goods. Pure public goods are just the diametrically opposed opposite of a pure private good. A pure public good will be non-excludable and non-exhaustible. So something such as the provision of national defense is usually considered to be a pure public good. Again, admittedly, there is a role that the private sector plays through contracting out. And so the DOD will enter into contracts with Boeing and for other companies uh, in order to create these implements of war, whether they be planes or missiles or whatever, they will create those under a government contract. However, the actual contracts themselves are being paid for by the government. So the resources are government resources paying for those contracts. And then the actual production of national defense will be done by Army and Navy and Marines and, and Air Force and these public types of entities. National defense is considered to be non-excludable and non-exhaustive in that it's non-excludable. The benefit that I get from national defense, if I get a feel I get a greater sense of safety from national defense than you do, 
you can't charge me a higher amount for national defense than you get charged just because I get more of a benefit. And so you don't have that chargeability type of mechanism with a pure public good. And you don't have that exhaustibility either that the benefit I get is not reduced by the benefit that you get from national defense. So it's a pure public good. We typically see a heightened role for public to play in both provision as well as production of pure public goods. So those are at the opposite ends of the spectrum from each other. Those are relatively easy for us in the study of public administration to determine, yes, this is something done by government that we study. This is something that's done by the private sector that is usually more in the domain of an MBA program to study. Where it gets a little muddy and a little complicated is in the gray area between those two extremes. And so there are two types of goods that fit within that gray area. And those two different types of goods are what we refer to as toll goods and common pool goods. Oops. Toll goods and common pool goods. A toll good is just what it sounds like. It's like a toll road. And so with a toll good, you can exclude people from getting the benefits of that good, but it's difficult to exhaust and use that good up. So you think about a toll road, and I know today we have transponders and all that fancy stuff. You know, Back in the day, you had a little basket there and we had the bar and then you would pull up to that bar that was down. You throw your coins in the basket. If you throw in the right amount, then the bar goes up and you drive through and can drive on the toll road. Everyone who has the correct amount of money that puts in the basket, they can then drive on that toll road. So it essentially is, uh, is um, you know, excludable in that if you don't have that money and you don't have the money to put in the basket, the bar stays down, you are then prohibited from driving on that toll road. So it is an excludable type of good, but it's not exhaustive in that everyone who pays, the bar goes up and they get to drive on the toll road. You may have to wait until I get out of your way uh, to free up some road, room on the road, but that's considered to be something that is non-exhaustible. So it's excludable and non-exhaustible. That's a toll good. Then the opposite of a toll good is a common pool good. And a common pool good, they tend to be more non-excludable, but they tend to be exhaustible. So you think about something like natural resources, mineral pool rights, those types of things kind of fall into that common pool type of category. The toll goods and common pool goods, we can certainly have a mixture of public and private participation in provision and production. So the most common mixture we tend to get is through contracting out. So government will put out a request for proposals for the you know, construction of a building, and then the, um, the, the contractors will then submit their bids, the sealed bids in this competitive bidding process, and the government will then enter into a contract with this private sector corporation to then construct that building. The provision is on the public side in that the public organization is paying for this contract. The actual production of creating that building, constructing that building, is then left to the private contractor. So there you have public provision, but you have private sector production. The opposite of that, private provision and public production, those examples are not quite as prevalent. So when you've got an example like that, think about a situation where you have a concert promoter. That concert promoter is putting on a concert, and so they obviously want to have security at that concert. So they hire the local police department to come and actually do the security at that venue. Local police department is then being paid for their time in doing the security. So the provision is private and the production is then public. But it's important distinction when we talk about this idea of public programs, public goods, and public services. It depends upon the good or service or program, just how public or how private it really is. And defining something as being public or private in nature will then give us a lot of insight into the proper role of government, of public organizations, of public bureaucracies in the provision and or the production of those goods and those services. 
The problem, as we said before, with public bureaucracies is that people tend to treat bureaucracy as a monolithic term, and they also tend to have very negative perceptions of bureaucracies, as well as public administrators, as well as bureaucrats within those organizations. The contention sometimes among the public is that the bureaucracy is really too inefficient to accomplish much of anything of value, but at the same time, it is occupied with bureaucrats who tend to be very efficient users and sometimes abusers of power and public resources. So that's kind of gets back to what we did in our breakout groups. We had some really great examples of administrators who were efficient uh, abusers and misusers of power and resources. I think a lot of us would disagree with that contention and say that hopefully most of our administrators are ethical. They are there to promote the public service above their own private interests, but that doesn't really limit this um, contention on the part of some members of the public. But in public administration, we are studying public bureaucracies. Public bureaucracies are these public organizations. that are these formal, rational systems of relationships. And that's what we tend to study in the world of public administration. One thing we have come to realize over the years is that public administration really does suffer from this crisis of identity in that public administration sometimes struggles to separate itself from the world of business and to show how it is distinct from private administration. So we're going to spend some time tonight talking about some of those notable distinctions between public and private organizations, public and private sector. One of the most notable ways in which the public sector is different is what we had already talked about in terms of administrative authority, the role of public authority, that we have public administrators who are endowed with these legal types of authority, this legal basis for their actions, for their behavior, something we don't necessarily see in the private sector. We also know that there are some organizational processes in the public sector that are characteristic of public organizations that we don't always see over in private corporations. And so as we'll talk about a little bit later on tonight, things such as the staffing function, managing human resources. There are some specific processes that go on in the management of public human resources that we don't see going on in the management of private human resources. Same type of thing with the management of fiscal resources as well. Another way to look at some differences between the two sectors is in the public sector, public administrators and public organizations tend to be involved in both policy formulation as well as policy execution. And I tend to use the word execution interchangeably with implementation. When you go on to your 670 course and a couple of courses down the road, uh, Dr. Matthews will talk to you about the different phases of the policy process. You'll talk about policy formulation, policy implementation or execution, whichever words you like to use, and then policy evaluation. Public organizations are involved in both the formulation of the policy as well as the implementation of the policy. By contrast, private organizations tend to be much more involved in implementation and much less involved in the actual formulation of those public policies. And that's an idea that we're going to explore at length in just a couple of minutes. But before we get to there, I think one really good way to exemplify some of the major differences between public and private organizations is by looking at this federal law known as the Federal Anti-Deficiency Act. And this is just not an arcane federal law that doesn't mean a whole lot. This is something that we have dealt with very, very recently. So in this Federal Anti-Deficiency Act, the Federal Anti-Deficiency Act forbids government officials, public administrators, from spending on anything that is not explicitly authorized by law. So what we spend our money on must first be appropriated by a legislative body. We must first have legal authorization before we're able to spend that money. By contrast, private organizations are allowed to basically spend on anything that they want as long as that spending is not forbidden by law. 
So we can only spend on what's authorized in law. Public organizations, private organizations can spend on just about anything they want as long as that spending is not forbidden by law. That's a huge difference between the two sectors. We have a lot more limitations on how we spend our money in the public sector. And I said this was something that was uh, very prominent in the news, especially in the last administration, in the Trump administration. In the Trump administration, we had this massive change to our federal income tax structure that came from the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was the biggest change to our federal income tax structure since the Reagan administration and the Tax Reform Act in 1986. And there are a lot of changes in terms of uh, getting rid of exemptions in individual income tax filings, uh, changing the standard deduction, increasing the standard deduction so that more people would file simplified forms and fewer people would feel the need to itemize their deductions, uh, changes in the in tax credits in terms of the child tax credit, uh, earned income tax credit, and a lot of these other details in federal income tax code. The problem was that very soon after that, we ended up getting a government shutdown. So Congress and the president could not come to agreement on certain appropriation bills. And so we ended up with a partial government shutdown. One of those appropriation bills that was not agreed to was the appropriation bill for the Department of Treasury. The Department of Treasury is the parent department for the Internal Revenue Service. So we had a lot of IRS agents, especially those who do customer service, who were furloughed because they didn't have the legal authority to be paid to go to work. So they're told to just stay home. So when they were furloughed, we had all these taxpayers who had all these questions about what the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act meant for their tax forms. They were calling up the customer service line and the phone was ringing off the hook because there was no one there to answer those questions. The Trump administration obviously was not happy about that because they wanted to see the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act provisions implemented fully. And so they wanted to order these IRS officials back to work and then to pay them. Problem with that is there was no legal authorization to pay them. The Anti-Deficiency Act says you cannot do that. If you don't have the legal authority to pay someone, you can't pay them. And so those IRS agents were not able to come back to work. And this whole situation kind of expedited the agreement on an Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act to get the government shut down over with. And so this was one of the reasons why the government shutdown ended up being done with and ended. So this Anti-Deficiency Act is just not an archaic law. It's something that we actually saw prominently in the news in the last administration, but just introduces these limitations in terms of what we can do, what we can spend money on in the public sector as compared to what the private sector can do. One of the articles that you were assigned for this week out of the classics textbook was this article by Graham Allison. And it's article number 36, I believe, on page 384. I hope you had a chance to take a look at it. Uh, it's titled, Public and Private Management, Are They Fundamentally Alike in All Unimportant Respects? And the part of the article I really want to focus on is the typology that Allison creates for us in terms of similarities between public and private sectors versus differences between public and private sectors. And so first, let's deal with some of the similarities. So I will ask you, what are some of the similarities between private and public organizations? So put it another way, if you were the leader of an organization, regardless of whether it's in the private or the public sector, what are some of the types of things that you would need to do as a leader of your organization? What do all organizations, there we go. Yeah, Renee says planning, absolutely. All organizations need to engage in strategic planning. We need to do strategic planning. We need to identify our goals and our objectives, then put together our action plans in order to try and achieve those goals and those objectives that hopefully are in, in alignment with our organizational mission. You see that in the public sector, you see that in the private sector. 
as Alyssa says, budgeting. Money is the lifeblood of an organization. If you don't have funding, you cannot pay for the daily operations of your organization. You can't pay salaries and benefits. You can't pay for leases and the offices that you are leasing. You cannot pay for um, supplies that you use on a daily basis, maintenance costs, uh, utilities. Can't pay for any of that. So you need to have money, both public and private organizations. Carlos says staffing. Absolutely. You need to get people into the organization who have the requisite knowledge, skills, and abilities in order to do the job. You do that in the public sector as well as in the private sector. Um, you need to organize. As a leader in the organization, you need to organize people. You need to organize resources for the purposes of accomplishing your stated goals and objectives that you established back in your strategic planning process. So you need to organize. You need to direct the behaviors and the activities of people who work in your organization to again, achieve your goals and objectives. You need to be good at coordinating efforts. You have to make sure that all the different units and the folks working in your organization are working in a symbiotic way in order to, again, achieve those goals and those objectives. So you have to engage in a lot of coordination. You have to have a reporting mechanism in place so that you can report on how money is being spent. So you can also report on how your activities are then linked to the achievement of your goals and objectives and what type of progress you are making in achieving those goals and objectives. This is what Allison refers to as this acronym of POSCO. And we will talk about PASCORP again next week when we talk about the principal school of public administration. But in PASCORP, what we are doing is we're looking at planning, organizing, staffing, directing, coordinating, reporting, and budgeting, P-O-S-D-C-R-B. Some people put C-O in there, but I just go P-O-S-D-C-R-B, PASCORP. PASCORP are these generic management functions. These are generic management functions that are done by all organizations, irrespective of which sector they are located in. In public administration, especially in the early part of the 1900s, the way in which we viewed public organizations was through the lens of what we called a generic management focus, that we just looked at these generic functions that we said were the same between private and public organizations, the upshot of that is if it works in the private sector, we should take it over and put it in the public sector and it should work equally well in the public sector. So those generic management functions are similar between private and public organizations. What Allison argues though, is it's not really a difference in what we are doing. We're doing the same types of generic functions. The difference between the sectors is in how we are doing it. So the difference is in terms of how we plan, how we organize, how we staff, how we coordinate, how we report, and how we budget. So let's look at the idea of staffing, the idea of personnel, human resource management, and how that differs between the sectors. In the private sector, your employees are typically at-will employees. They are hired on an at-will basis. They serve at the will of the organization. They are much easier to get rid of, to fire, they're much easier to discipline, they're much easier to promote, they're much easier to compensate and provide monetary rewards for, those are at-will employees. In the public sector, we work with career civil servants. Career civil servants have certain protections built into civil service law. So in 1883, we had this Pendleton Act, and then 1939, we had a Hatch Act, 1978, we had a Civil Service Reform Act. We have specific provisions in law that means employees, career civil servants, have protections from being dismissed for political purposes. If you're going to discipline and dismiss someone from the career civil service, you must do it for cause. You must have performance evaluations, multiple performance evaluations that demonstrate subpar performance, you have to document that subpar performance. You then have to offer training and development opportunities in order to mitigate that subpar performance, then reevaluate if the performance is still subpar, 
You have to offer more training and development and different training and development opportunities. And it will take you multiple evaluations and multiple uh, offers of training and development before you'll finally be able to discipline and eventually terminate a career civil servant because they are in that position based upon their merit. They get their job based upon their qualifications. They keep their job based upon their performance. So in the public sector as public managers, yes, we manage human resources, but our hands are much more tied in terms of how we manage those personnel as compared to our private sector counterparts. And then overlay on top of all these civil service protections embodied in the law, overlay on top of that unionization. And when you look at rates of unionization in the public sector, about 31, 32% of public employees at the federal level are unionized. Compare that to the private sector, where about 11 or 12% of private sector employees are unionized. So much higher levels of unionization which means that we have collective bargaining agreements that we also have to adhere to. And those collective bargaining agreements are going to spell out a lot of specifics in terms of how we manage these career civil servants. So we'll have stipulations in there in terms of how they are evaluated, how frequently they're evaluated. We'll have stipulations in there about opportunities for professional development. We'll have stipulations in there in terms of how people are, are disciplined and eventually perhaps terminated from their positions. All that will be spelled out in that collective bargaining agreement on top of the civil service regulations. So we are much more limited in how we can manage our staffing, manage our personnel. We measure performance in both sectors. You know, that's something that we always have to do if we're not performing well, we want to address that subpar performance as an organization. But the way in which we measure performance in the public sector is obviously different than the private sector. In the private sector, you have much more empirical quantitative measures of performance. So you're running a widget factory. That widget factory is in the business of creating the highest quality widgets possible to sell as many units as you can possibly sell. So when you're measuring your performance, you're looking at the amount of resources that you are using in order to create the output, in order to create the widgets that you are creating. So you want to be as efficient as you can be. You also want to have some performance measures in terms of the quality of those widgets. So you'll have specifications in terms of uh, for quality control, you know, the, the quality of each one of those widgets that you are creating. Those are very quantitative empirical measures. In the public sector, we oftentimes are doing things such as uh, trying to enhance the quality of life of citizens. That's a much more subjective, much more qualitative measure. And so it's a little bit more difficult, obviously, for us to measure that type of performance. Um, as Evan says, short-lived tenure for public head CEOs compared to the private sector based on performance, harder to measure. Absolutely. Our public leaders of our public organizations do tend to have uh, much shorter tenures, maybe 18 to 24 months. And so, yeah, it introduces a, a break in continuity. It makes it a little bit more difficult, certainly, for us to measure performance. Whenever new leaders come in, they may have different things they want to focus on, different ways in which they want to measure performance as opposed to what you may see in the private sector. So absolutely. We had talked about in our first session together this whole idea of serving many masters in the public sector. So when you serve many masters, it means we have competing standards that we are held accountable for. And so we may have some standards imposed upon us by the chief executive, other standards imposed upon us by a legislative body, other standards imposed upon us by the judicial branch, certain standards imposed upon us by the national government, some imposed upon us by a state government. So we serve these many masters horizontally and vertically, which means we have competing standards that we are held accountable for. We all know we operate in a fishbowl, like we talked about last week, especially here in the state of California, we have some very stringent transparency and openness requirements for public organizations. Far more open, far more transparent than what you'll see in the private sector. That certainly has an impact upon how we do our jobs on a daily basis. Because our public leaders uh, serve relatively shorter terms and because they have all these other limitations in terms of civil service protections, in terms of provisions in the collective bargaining agreement, they have to rely a lot more on persuasion than their private sector counterparts. They don't have the same authority 
to say, you must do this and this is how you do it, they oftentimes have to persuade people because they're working within the parameters of these limitations. Uh, there's a, a story back, I know this for an elected official, but there are stories back in the end of the Truman administration. And when Truman's administration was ending and Dwight David Eisenhower was coming into the presidency, Truman said that Dwight Eisenhower would be the most frustrated man in Washington, D.C. As Eisenhower was coming from a military background, he was used to telling people, do this, and they would do it. Because if they didn't do it, then they would be in the brig or they would be demoted. So he would, could get people to do things very quickly. As president, he found out he had to use the power of persuasion. And as Richard Neustadt tells us, persuasion is one of the most powerful resources that a president has. I would argue that's also one of the most powerful resources that public managers have as well. As Evan points out, in addition, you know, we've got limitations that come out of these memoranda of understanding. Uh, sometimes you have MOUs between public, certain different public organizations. Sometimes if you have public-private partnerships, you'll have MOUs between public and private organizations, public and nonprofit organizations. Sometimes MOUs between state and local government and federal and state or federal and local government. Um, you also have um, structural remedies and things such as consent decrees that are handed down by courts that will also place limitations upon what we can do as public organizations as well. And we know that since we serve many masters, we have a lot of oversight that we are held accountable for. We have oversight from the legislature, from the executive, from the judicial branch, oversight from the national government, as well as from state governments. And this is not a universal list, obviously, but this is just kind of the highlight, the list of the highlights of some of the major differences we see between public and private organizations. But one of those differences we really do need to focus on is this idea of the bottom line, the profit motive. Because typically when you ask someone, you know, what's the primary difference between a public organization and a private organization? They will say, well, private corporations have to run a profit Public organizations do not. And there certainly is a great deal of truth to that. I think that distinguishing between the sectors based upon whether or not they have a profit motive, I think that's what we would consider to be a necessary but not sufficient differentiation. And that's necessary to point that out. But we cannot differentiate between private and public organizations by profit motive alone. Because we know we do have some government organizations, such as government corporations, that are enabled to run a profit. So they do try and run a profit. So something like the U.S. Postal Service is a government corporation. It technically has the ability to run a profit. Now, typically it doesn't, but that's another story for another day. But government corporations have the ability to run a profit, but yet they are government corporations. They are under the auspices of the government. They are still considered to be a public organization. On the flip side of the coin, we have some private non-governmental organizations that are nonprofit in nature. A nonprofit organization, the goal of a nonprofit organization is to advance a social agenda, to provide for the welfare of the public uh, in terms of the provision of certain types of services. It's not to run a profit. They are um, precluded in terms of their nonprofit status from running a profit. So we can have private organizations that do not run profits. We can have public organizations that do operate to run a profit. So this profit motive is important, but it is not solely sufficient for distinguishing between public and private organizations. What I think is a lot more useful in distinguishing between public and private organizations is to go back to this point that we raised a few slides ago about the role that public and private organizations play in policy formulation versus policy implementation and execution. So we know that public and private organizations both engage in policy implementation. For public organizations, they are the ones that are most directly responsible for implementing these policies and these laws that come out of a legislative body. But we also know that private corporations also have a role to play in implementation. Again, you think about things like government regulation. That government regulation is then something that needs to be adhered to by those private corporations. So we oftentimes say, okay, with these regulations, we are going to say private corporation 
you must carry out these regulations, which means they are involved in policy implementation. The big difference between the sectors is that while both sectors are involved in policy implementation, it's really the public sector that is much more involved in policy formulation. It's these public organizations that oftentimes contribute to this formal policy formulation process. So as we said, policy execution implementation is carrying out the laws. Policy formulation is actually designing and putting those laws together. So administrators are involved in policy formulation in terms of providing advice to elected officials in the creation, the formulation, the design of these policies. They are also involved in writing the rules and regulations that will then govern the implementation of those policies. As we had mentioned in this class before, if you want to get a majority of 435 members of the House of Representatives to agree to a law, that law is probably going to have to be relatively vague and ambiguous. So you're going to leave out a lot of the details. Those details then are fleshed out by administrators through the administrative rulemaking process. So it's really the public sector that is very involved in both formulation as well as implementation. Well, I love the question, so what? So, well, so what? So we have these administrators involved in policy formulation. What difference does that make? That makes a couple of important differences. One important difference is whenever you involve administrators in the formulation of policy, you end up with more technical public policies because these folks are the ones who are the experts in these policies. So they will bring their specific competence in this policy area to bear in the formulation of the policy. So we tend to get much more technical policies with a lot more jargon whenever administrators are involved in policy formulation. And then the second important artifact of that is whenever we involve administrators in formulation, those administrators are under the direct auspices of the chief executive because they are part of the executive branch. So whenever we have these executive officials involved more in policy formulation, we are expanding the role of the chief executive in policy formulation as well. So it really does make a difference why we have public administrators involved in the policy formulation process. So that basically means that at times, we have administrators who are involved in the political side, the creation of policies, while at the same time being involved in the administrative side, the implementation and the execution of those policies. That dichotomy between the political side and the administrative side is what we get out of Woodrow Wilson in his very famous article, The Study of Administration. But we're at eight o'clock now, so I think it's a, we're well past time for a break. So let's go ahead and take a break. Um, let's say, let's take a break until 8.15. And then we'll come back at 8.15 and we'll talk about Woodrow Wilson and this politics administration dichotomy. And we'll talk about what the politics administration dichotomy meant in the late 1800s versus what it means today and why it's probably much less true today than it was back then. And then we'll kind of distinguish between some of the motivations of administrators and policy formulation versus the motivations of elected officials in the policymaking process. So come on back at 815 and we'll continue our discussion with Woodrow Wilson and the politics administration dichotomy. Hey, welcome back everyone, it's 815. So we are back from our break and we'll continue our discussion with uh, Woodrow Wilson and his classic study called the study of administration. And the field of public administration itself really kind of owes its genesis to the type of argument that Wilson made back in 1887 in his study of administration. Now you will be reading the study of administration for next week, but I thought that what I would do is just kind of foreshadow it a little bit because it really kind of fits in well with what we are talking about tonight. But before we get into a discussion of Wilson and his argument, I think we all always have to make mention of the fact that Woodrow Wilson, history has not been kind to Woodrow Wilson in that history has really illustrated some of the unsavory and really downright disturbing 
positions and opinions that he held, uh, especially in terms of things such as race relations, and so much so that a lot of schools that had Woodrow Wilson on their buildings and on the name of their schools have decided subsequently to remove his name. Uh, Woodrow Wilson was a historian. He was a professor of history, uh, then became president of Princeton University, and then eventually became president of the United States. The very well-regarded school uh, at Princeton, the Woodrow Wilson School, uh, it's still called the Woodrow Wilson School, but they have removed the name Woodrow Wilson from the building. As I said, a lot of other universities have, have followed the same path. So when we talk about Woodrow Wilson tonight, we're certainly not extolling his virtues. Uh, all we're doing really is recognizing the impact that his writing had on the development of this field of public administration. So it's kind of a, a very narrow focus, if you will, on Woodrow Wilson. But Woodrow Wilson, in his study of administration, made the argument that public administration in the 1880s had become very, very complicated and very complex. The administration, the carrying out the implementation of policies and programs in the 1880s was so complex that Wilson argued we needed to separate out administration from politics and develop a standalone study, if you will, on administration, or what he referred to as the business of government. So Wilson felt that if you could pull politics out of administration, you could then focus on administration in terms of being more of a benign business-like type of endeavor, and you could then focus more on coming up with theories and models to make that administration more efficient and more effective. So one of the things that Wilson argued is he argued in this Paul, what he called the politics administration dichotomy, is that by pulling out politics, you can make administration this neutral instrument and study it as this neutral instrument separate from policy and politics. And then in doing so, what you could then do is when you separate politics from administration, then you can borrow administrative innovations from other countries and apply them to the American system of administration because you don't have to necessarily worry about political influence. So an example of that that he gave us is in terms of civil service. So for throughout most of the 1800s, from the 1820s until the 1880s, government employment was primarily based upon not what you knew. It was not based upon your qualifications, but rather it was based upon your allegiance to political parties and to winning candidates. That's why we talked about George Washington Plunkett and Tammany Hall. It's that type of situation where the political party controls the jobs and controls the resources of government. Then in 1881, we had the assassination of President Garfield. Assassination of President Garfield was done by a disgruntled office seeker named Charles J. Guiteau. And Guiteau essentially assassinated Garfield, hoping that his successor, Chester Arthur, who really believed in patronage and really believed in what we call the era of spoils, that he would then provide Guiteau with a job. Obviously, that didn't happen. But what did happen is the assassination of Garfield really galvanized public opinion around the idea that instead of hiring people based upon party and by having this uh, influence of politics and administration, instead, we should hire people based upon their merit. We should hire people based upon their qualifications, their knowledge, skills, and abilities. So in 1883, we get this piece of legislation called the Pendleton Act that introduces an era of merit where people would be hired based upon their qualifications. Wilson's argument in 1887, right on the heels of the 1883 Pendleton Act, it's not a coincidence. And so Wilson is kind of agreeing with this focus on administration and competency in administration. So in this era of merit with the Pendleton Act, we bring career civil service into the federal bureaucracy, hiring people based upon their qualifications. We did not invent civil service 
in the United States. Civil service existed for many years before that in other countries. One country that had a very vibrant system of civil service was England. So what Wilson argues in his article is that we can borrow some of the innovations in the British civil service system and bring them over and apply them in our system to make our system of administration, what he called the business of government, much more efficient and much more effective. So some of the examples of things that he wanted to bring over from the British civil service system. One example was the use of examinations. So in England, they used examinations in order to test people to make sure they had the competency and the qualifications to become part of the civil service. The system of examinations they used in England was a system of closed examinations in that those examinations were not open to everyone. They were only open to a certain number of people. So they were very closed types of examinations. Wilson makes the argument that we'll borrow this innovation of using examinations, but to apply it to our more open political culture in America, we need to make an open examination. So we need to make these examinations open for anyone. So anyone can sit to take these examinations to then earn a job in the federal bureaucracy. So he took closed administrations and we made them into open, uh, closed examinations made them into open examinations. Another example he gives us is in the British system of civil service, you could enter from the private sector into the public sector. But when you did that, you had to go all the way to the bottom of the civil service and work your way up. So you could be a leader or a manager of a prominent private corporation. And you decide you want to go and work for government because you want to work in the public interest you would have to then go to the lowest level of the civil service and then work your way up through the ranks of the civil service. Obviously, Wilson recognized that's not going to work here in the U.S. So instead, in the Pendleton Act, what we did is we allow for lateral entry. So if you were a leader or manager at a high level in a private corporation, you could then enter the public sector at that same level. We allow for that lateral entry. Again, because we had this more open type of, of political culture. That was only possible because we had this focus on the study of administration. Now, there is a line in the Wilson article that is oftentimes overlooked when people talk about this politics administration dichotomy, the political world versus the administrative world. And that line says that politics are the touchstone of administration. And it's a very important caveat that Wilson included in his article. Politics are the touchstone of administration. So whenever we bring these administrative innovations into our system, we have to first make sure that they match up well with our political culture. Closed examinations didn't work well in our political culture, so we had to transform them into open examinations. Entry into the public sector needed to be lateral entry to, again, match with our more open political culture. So even though we are bringing these administrative uh, initiatives in and these different approaches in, we have to make sure that they match with our system of politics. Now, this idea of separating politics administration is instructive for us in the development of the study of public administration. However, we came to recognize very, very quickly that there really wasn't this strong line of demarcation between the political world and the administrative world. As we talked about on previous slides, we understand that public administrators get involved in politics. They get involved in the formulation of policy and not just the implementation of policy. So very quickly, we started to reject this politics administration dichotomy and recognize that administrators were very much involved in the political side of policy formulation. Uh, like we talked about last week, John Gauss back in 1936 was one of the first people to really shoot down this politics administration dichotomy. So today, administrators work on both sides of the fence. They work on the administrative side as well as the political side. However, it is important to note that even though both administrators and elected officials work in policy formulation, that they both work on the political side, the motivations of public administrators are oftentimes much different than the motivation of elected officials. 
The primary motivation of an elected official is what? What do most elected officials want to try and do? Re-election. Absolutely, re-election. Their primary motivation is to get re-elected. David Mayhew told us that way back decades ago in his book, Congress, The Electoral Connection. And Mayhew argued that the primary motivation is re-election. And so we see members of Congress engage in strategies and activities such as uh, credit claiming, where they want to claim credit for policies that they co-sponsor. Uh, they want to claim credit for uh, bridges that they got built in their district. They want to advertise their name because the more name recognition you have, the more likely it is you'll get reelected. They want to take high profile positions on very low risk types of issues. So, you know, mom, apple pie, those types of American types of issues, they'll come out and be, take very prominent positions on those because they're very low risk types of issues. All those things help them get reelected. So that's their primary motivation and policy. Hopefully, the primary motivation of a public administrator is to make good policy and to work in the public interest. So even though they're both working on the politics side, hopefully the motivations of public administrators are somewhat different than the motivations of elected officials. So Woodrow Wilson provides us this basis for the separate study of public administration. That's really the genesis of the development of the field of public administration. Don Kettle, if you read the chapters in the textbook, you'll see that Don Kettle presents to us three different generalizations about the study of public administration. The first generalization about the study of public administration is that public administration is timeless yet it is time bound, which is a really nice sounding thing, but what does he mean by that? Public administration is timeless in that there are some maxims and some theories of public administration that have really stood the test of time. So treating your employees well, valuing your employees, helping your employees achieve their goals and their objectives in life, helping them do what um, Abraham Maslow called self-actualize. Those types of theories, those types of maxims are just as true today as they were in the 1950s and the 1940s. So some of those theories are certainly timeless. However, a lot of the theories that we've developed in public administration that we'll talk about next week are also time bound, meaning that they are artifacts of their time. So we'll talk next week about a classical theory such as scientific management from someone named Frederick Taylor. Scientific management in the 19 teens and the 1920s was an artifact of its time. At that time, we had a lot of labor unrest, worker unrest in our factories. Factories were very uh, bad places to work. They were very dangerous places to work. And so scientific management was meant to try and deal with some of that chaos that was going on in those factories uh, at that point in time. So the development of scientific management was very much an artifact of its time. Uh, the development of something like human resource management theory in the 1950s and the 1960s was also an artifact of its time. There was a point in time in which organizations were becoming a little bit more diversified, a time in which we were really starting to pay attention to the psychology of employees. And so public administration theories can be timeless, but there are also artifacts of the time in which they were written. We also know a second generalization is that public administration is universal, but it is also culture bound and will vary according to a situation. This is why I told you in our very first class session that my favorite answer to most questions is it depends. Because the most appropriate answer will depend upon the context of the situation that we are dealing with. So as we said at the outset tonight, public administration is universal. It's encountered everywhere. However, the theories that we develop must be appropriate for the culture of the organization we're dealing with, as well as the context of the situation in which we are dealing. Mary Parker Follett referred to that as leading by situation. The third generalization about the study of public administration is public administration is complex, 
but is it intelligible only by simplified models or a step-by-step -step combining of models? In other words, public administration is a very complex world. It's a very complicated world. And with another slide, we'll talk about some of the reasons why public administration tends to be so complicated. But the only way we can really understand this complex world is by developing theories and models. And if you remember from an undergraduate research course, there's a difference between a theory and a model. A theory will postulate a relationship between abstract constructs. So these concepts that have not really been well fleshed out yet, but we have a general idea of what they are. We have a general idea of what they mean. They're at the abstract concept level. And at that abstract concept level, our theory will then postulate a relationship between those abstract concepts. But it's still difficult for us to measure. So what we have to do is take those abstract theories and we have to then distill them into more specific models, models that will postulate relationships between observable and measurable variables. Those observable measurable variables will then be indicators of those abstract concepts that we had in our theory. So we have to develop these theories and these models that are intended to help us understand the complex phenomena that we encounter in the world of public administration. Well, going back to my favorite question, well, so what? The so what of that is that if we need to develop theories and models to fit in specific situations, that means that that's gonna probably be an academic discipline because that's what disciplines do. Disciplines develop unique theories and models to explain the unique phenomena in those fields of study. So kind of hold on to that for a couple of minutes because we're gonna to return to that when we talk about the idea of public administration as an academic discipline. But before we get there, let's drill down a little bit more in terms of this idea of the complexity of public administration and why organizational systems tend to be so complex that we need to develop multiple models and multiple theories in order to explain these complex organizations. So what makes our public organizations so complex? Well, there are a lot of complicating factors in the public sector. One complicating factor are all these interconnections between policy making and policy execution and implementation. Whenever you blur the lines between the political and the administrative world, you are by definition introducing a lot of complication and a lot of complexity. You then introduce a lot of questions about who has what role, what is the proper role for an administrator versus the proper role for an elected official? How involved should administrators be in the formulation of policy? How involved should elected officials be in implementation through things such as, as casework? Uh, if you've ever worked for a member of Congress or a member of a state legislature, you know that that member probably spends a lot of their time doing casework, doing work for constituents. So constituents reach out to the office and say, I did not receive my social security check, or I was denied eligibility for this federal program. So that member's office will then go and investigate that situation and then advocate on the behalf of their constituent. That's casework. That's getting involved in the administrator side in the side of policy implementation. So you blur those lines and you end up certainly mudding the water and making for a more complicated situation. The need for coordination. As we know today, a lot of programs and policies are not being implemented by a singular public agency, but rather they're being implemented by a network of public agencies, sometimes a network of public-private partnerships, sometimes a network of public nonprofit partnerships it requires a lot of coordination between different types of government. The more coordination that is required, obviously the more complexity there is in the way in which these policies are being implemented. Uh, there's a whole body of literature in public administration referred to as governing networks. And if you're really interested in governing networks, um, there's a person actually at the University of Laverne, so very local, uh, by the name of Jack Meek. And Jack Meek uh, is a Cleveland Browns fan, so um, that's one reason why I like him. 
But I also like a lot of the work he's done in governing networks. And he's really looked at some of the challenges and some of the opportunities in governing through these networks of different organizations and different sectors in implementing these policies and these programs. But again, that means more coordination. The more coordination means more complexity. There's a lot of complexity that's introduced in terms of these relationships that have to exist between different organizations and the power distribution and the uses of power between those organizations as well. We had talked about the multi-dimensional definition of power, and I introduced you to John Gaventa and those three different faces of power, of overt power and mobilization of bias and co-optation. We know that power, because it's multidimensional, is a complex topic in and of itself. But to understand the nuances of the relationship between organizations, as well as the relationship between people within organizations, how power is being exercised, the different faces of power, that's going to introduce a lot of complexity in the public administration as well. Another source of complexity is this idea that public organizations are floating within the seas of time meaning that just like theories are artifacts of the time in which they were created, organizations are artifacts of the time in which they are operating as well. We see organizations go through a life cycle, and there's an entire body of literature on the life cycle of organizations, that organizations go through an acceleration period. So when organizations are first formed, they have a lot of political support and they have ample resources. And they tend to go through this acceleration phase. Uh, at some point in time, they will then stop accelerating and start going through a deceleration phase. Or they'll start losing resources into their environment. They won't have the same political support. And they'll have an aging workforce. They'll start becoming more institutionally rigid and more distant from the citizens that they are serving. And then eventually you end up with agency decline. And in some cases, not a lot, but in some cases, agency extinction. So there's kind of this life cycle of agencies in terms of how they start and how they end. They're kind of floating within these seas of time. So you have to understand where an agency is in terms of its maturation level, if you will, in terms of its developmental stages. Top down and bottom up. Top-down and bottom-up refers to the hierarchical systems. So how top-down is the hierarchy, how bottom-up is the hierarchy. So in a top-down hierarchical system, we've got that pyramidal type of organization structure. We'll have a singular director or agency, or agency head. As you move down the pyramid, you then encounter more and more positions. That's your classic tall hierarchy. Some of our organizations are structured in that classic tall hierarchy. Other organizations are much flatter in nature. You think about organizations such as a commission that's headed up by three or five or seven commissioners. That's a much flatter type of organizational structure. So different types of structures, again, add a lot of variety and a lot of complexity. The amount of information that we deal with in the public sector also adds to complexity. You know, think about all the sources of information that we have today in the public sector compared to 1887. You know, Wilson thought that it was complicated in 1887. I would shudder to think what he would think about the complexity in today's public administration. We have information that surrounds us, not just from government databases, not just from reliable sources such as the Government Accountability Office and those audits that are being created by the Government Accountability Office but also from social media, from the internet, from all over the place. So it's important that we become very well-informed consumers so that we can identify credible, verifiable information. And then in a rational way, because again, going back to our definition of a public organization, we are formal and rational. So in a rational way, we can utilize proper information to then arrive at the most appropriate decisions. Add into that today things like generative AI and the influence that artificial intelligence is now having on the field of public administration. There's a discussion going on in, in the academic world, obviously, about how much artificial intelligence should play a role in the academic world. 
Uh, I have some colleagues in the department that in their syllabi, they say you're not allowed to use AI at all. And if uh, you're discovered using AI, it's considered to be academic dishonesty. That's kind of their position. Uh, my position is a little bit different. In my classes, I, I want you to kind of embrace AI. I want you to embrace it, recognizing its limitations. And so the use of artificial intelligence can, can be helpful if you're doing it for like brainstorming. So in a, in a class, if you have to come up with a research topic uh, and try and narrow down that research topic, sometimes AI is very helpful in doing that. You know, chat GPT can help you in doing that. Uh, obviously, you should not be using it to write discussion board posts and to write papers, and that's um, pretty easily discoverable these days. But I do think artificial intelligence is going to have an important role to play in the future of public administration. So we can either bury our heads in the sand and say, oh, it's academic dishonesty, or we can try and embrace it and kind of learn how to use it and leverage it to make it serve the public interest. And I think that's going to be probably the main challenge over the next 10 to 20 years in public organizations. Uh, different structures of organizations in terms of a headquarters or field type of an approach. Some of our organizations are centralized, so everyone is working in the same workspace. Some of our organizations, like the Department of Agriculture, will have a very long history of having field and regional offices that are dispersed all over the country in all different states. So sometimes you have centralized administration, sometimes you have much more decentralized. In the wake of COVID-19, obviously a lot of organizations are struggling with the idea of remote hybrid work types of assignments. So in COVID-19, we had people who were working remotely. Now organizations have to decide, do you bring those people back into the physical workspace? Do you bring them back in on a part-time basis to allow them to continue working remotely? The situation that they're running into is that when employees were working remotely and when they were still being productive, they were still getting good performance evaluations, sometimes employees will push back on coming back to the physical work environment and say, I was doing just as good of a job working remotely as I would have been doing in the physical work environment. I know here at the university, we've really struggled with it. In my last year as chair, uh, I really had to struggle with how much to bring our staff, our departmental staff back to campus. We had to keep the office open to provide services to students, but I still have uh, staff members who were doing a very good job working remotely. And I think a lot of organizations are still dealing with that. Then you also have all these considerations such as monitoring work that's being done on a remote basis, uh, things such as how you evaluate that work, things such as team building and kind of building this esprit de corps that is so important for organization culture. And how do you do that effectively when you have people working in all these different remote locations? And then as we had discussed earlier in an earlier session, the idea of the different types of values that underpin public administration also adds some complex, uh, complexity. In the private sector, we're concerned primarily about effectiveness and efficiency. In the public sector, we add on things such as strengthening social equity and social justice, responsive uh, political responsiveness, representative bureaucracy, the protection of individual and constitutional rights, the more values that you have, the more likely that some of those values will end up coming into conflict with each other. And then again, adding complexity to the study of public administration. So what this means is that public administration is a very complex field to study. It means that the reality of public administration is too complex to be explained by abstract theories. We really need to take those theories and distill them into measurable variables and measurable models. And one single model, one single theory will certainly not be sufficient for understanding such a complex set of phenomena as we have in the public sector. So what? What does this prolonged discussion of the complexity of public administration mean for us? What it means for us is it helps to inform whether or not we feel that public administration is truly an academic discipline or if it is merely a subfield within another academic discipline. And there are a lot of different ways in which we can go about trying to answer this question. We're not going to try and answer this question tonight. This is a question we're going to answer uh, over the next couple of weeks. And so we're not going to answer it right now. 
But there are a couple of different ways or multiple different ways we can go about addressing the question. And the first way to address the question is to ask the question, of what are the elements of an academic discipline? So now here at Cal State Long Beach, we have different departments and disciplines. We have uh, political science, we have history, we have social work, we have psychology, we have sociology, and we have public health, we have healthcare administration, we have biology and chemistry and physics and engineering and so on and so on. So we've got all these different departments and most of these departments are oriented around what they consider to be an academic discipline. So what are the elements of an academic discipline? One of the first elements of an academic discipline is that an academic discipline deals with unique phenomena. That the phenomena you study in an academic discipline is somewhat different and distinct from the phenomena that are studied in another academic discipline. So if you think about what we study in public administration, we are studying public organizations, which as we have established throughout the class tonight, are fundamentally different in how they carry out their functions as compared to private organizations that are studied in a Master's of Business Administration program. So you have unique phenomena that you are studying. A second element of an academic discipline is in studying that unique phenomena, you tend to develop unique methods to study that unique phenomena. So you'll use different methods to study history than you'll use to study political science. So if you think about what you are studying in history, oftentimes in history, you are studying a certain period of time. And the way in which you're gonna study that certain period of time is oftentimes to use more qualitative types of approaches. So you may use something like a thematic content analysis, which is a very common approach in the world of history. So you'll look at writings that were done at that period of time. You'll go through those writings and then you'll do a thematic content analysis where you will try and categorize different themes that you see in that, that writing then you'll look at another writing that was done at the same period of time, and then you'll do a thematic content analysis. So it tends to be a much more qualitative approach in the way the methods that we use in studying historical types of phenomena. Political science is called political science for a reason. It's no longer government, it's political science, because it has become much more quantitative in its orientation. And you can pick up any political science journal over the past few years, compare it to the articles in political science journals from the 1950s and the 1960s. And the articles you see today are going to be much more statistically oriented than what you saw 40 or 50 or 60 years ago. Today in political science, we really emphasize the science by using quantitative measurements. And so we are going to use um, statistical approaches such as OLS regression or uh, binary logistic regression and probe it and survival analysis and all those different very um, statistical types of approaches. The world of economics, you're probably going to use things such as econometrics, and that's going to be the unique methodology that you're going to use in the world of economics. So an academic discipline studies unique phenomena using unique types of methods and procedures. And then the purpose of applying these unique methods and procedures to the study of unique phenomena is obviously to then generate unique theories and models to help you better understand those unique phenomena. So the theories and the models that you get in history are going to look different than the theories and the models that you get in political science. The models in political science are going to be much more quantitative and much more uh, your variables are going to be much more statistically operationalized, if you will, than what you're going to see uh, over in the world of history. So I think those are three important elements of an academic discipline. Another way to try and answer the question of whether or not public administration is an academic discipline or a subfield in another academic discipline is to look at the administrative structures around the country for the provision of MPA programs. Now here at Cal State Long Beach, our MPA program is delivered through a standalone academic department, the Graduate Center for Public Policy and Administration. And I think I may have mentioned during our orientation session, but even though we call ourselves a graduate center, 
we are an academic department, just like any other department on campus. Uh, it's just the use of the term graduate center is something that was developed in 1973, and it just kind of has, has lived with us ever since. But we are a standalone academic department with our own budget, with our own program, our own faculty. All of our faculty teach 100% in the MPA program. So that's our arrangement. But our program that's located within the Department of the Graduate Center of Public Policy Administration is located within a College of Health and Human Services. That is a relatively unique arrangement for other MPA programs around the country. I think there are only maybe two or three other MPA programs that are actually included within a College of Health or a College of Human Services. I won't get into all the reasons for why we're in the College of Health and Human Services, but it is kind of an artifact of the past. We used to be our own college back in the 1970s. Then the university grew and we were too small to be a college. And so we were given the choice of going into the College of Liberal Arts or a brand new College of Health and Human Services. And the faculty at that time chose College of Health and Human Services because they want to be a big fish in a little pond. Subsequent to that, over the years, College of Health and Human Services has now gone from being a small pond to being a big ocean. And so it's a much different situation than it was back then. In doing my accreditation site visits, I've had the opportunity to visit dozens of programs around the country. And the primary administrative structure for MPA education tends to be within a Department of Political Science. The program I'm doing a site visit for in two weeks, that program is located within a division of politics. That is by far the most common administrative arrangement. I think it's something like 45 or 46% of all MPA programs around the country are in a de uh, department of political science. But we also see other arrangements. We see like when I was at Ohio State, the public administration program at that time was within the College of Business. So it's just another program, another department within the College of Business. Uh, now, subsequent to that, they've generated a lot of their own funding and the, um, the late Senator John Glenn added a lot of money to the endowment. So now they're their own school of public policy. They're their own college. But back then they were part of the College of Business. Uh, we see some MPA programs that are housed within colleges of public health, uh, colleges and departments of healthcare administration. Uh, we see some that are combined with departments of, of social work. So there are a lot of different administrative arrangements, which basically suggests to us that the question of whether or not public administration is a standalone academic discipline has never really been fully answered. Some people will say, yes, it is. Some people will say, no, it's a subfield of another field like political science. When I went through graduate school and got my doctorate, I was in a department of political science. So public policy and public administration served as a comprehensive examination area for me. So I took my comprehensive exams in public policy administration. Another area was presidency. Another area was Congress. Another area was state and urban government. It was one of four different comprehensive exam areas. So for my program, public administration was just a subfield within the academic discipline of political science. So that's just a little bit of insight in how you can determine whether or not something is an academic discipline. Moving forward, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be grappling with this question of, does the study of public administration demonstrate the elements of being an academic discipline? And to form an opinion on whether or not you feel that public administration is an academic discipline or just a field within another academic discipline. The big so what question, obviously, is that you are in an MPA program. So as students in an MPA program, you need to have a good understanding of what public administration is and what we are studying and how we are studying it. And so understanding how we study public administration is really elemental to understanding whether or not it is an academic discipline. So in future assignments, such as your Canvas essay number four, you are going to be broaching this question of, is public administration an academic discipline and why? And so this information we've covered here tonight will then be information that will be very helpful for you as you deal with Canvas essay number four. Now, again, like everything else, there's no right or wrong answer. So if you believe it's an academic discipline, 
you'll be justifying why you think it's an academic discipline. How unique is it? How different is it from other academic disciplines? If you don't feel it's an academic discipline, then, well, how similar is it to other fields? And is it too similar to other fields to then be considered a separate academic discipline? So as long as you are able to justify your answer in Canvas essay number four, that's really what I'm looking for, because there truly is no right or wrong answer in terms of that question. But up to this point in time, what we have done is we've kind of laid out this framework for the study of public administration. And we have established this argument that public administration is unique in terms of its comparison to business administration. And that there are some unique elements in public administration that we study. And for any academic discipline, the ultimate goal of that discipline is to develop theories and models that will help us better understand the unique phenomena within that field of study. So the next place we are going to is a discussion of these theoretical perspectives in the field of public administration. And this is what we are going to do next week. We're not going to do this tonight because we certainly don't have time to get through this tonight. But in our class next week, I would like to walk you through the development of theoretical perspectives in the field. We'll start with the late 1800s and we'll talk about the classical school. Then we'll talk about neoclassical schools such as human relations, human resource management, uh, systems theory, uh, organization culture, and some others and kind of track this evolution from the 1800s until the modern point in time. And as we go through that evolution, we will point out some of the connective tissue that links a lot of these theories together, as well as in uh, pointing out to you as well, some of the differences between these theories. So we're gonna organize our discussion according to different schools of thought. Classical school, human relations school, human resource management school, and so on and so on. So that's the information that we will start out with next week. That information will then provide you with all the information you need to do scenario number five on the midterm assessment. So when we're done with class next week, it'll probably be a little shorter class next week, but when we're done with class next week, you'll have all the information you need to then be successful on the midterm assessment. Okay, I've been talking a lot now for the past couple of hours, so let's break for any questions. Do you have any questions about any of this information we've covered, differences between public and private sector organizations, the idea of public administration as kind of this unique field of study? Any questions about any of that information or any clarifications? Okay. All right, if not, then I would propose, well, it's nine o'clock, so we'll go ahead and, and call it quits for the evening. And I'll get this recording then posted up onto our Canvas site no later than tomorrow morning. Then we will be back at it next Wednesday at six o'clock to do these theoretical perspectives on administration. And then also next week, I'm probably going to have to make a slight adjustment to the start time for our session on February 28th. Because on February 28th, I'll be on this site visit. I've already gotten the program to rearrange the schedule so that I'll be free to teach in the evening on the 28th so we don't miss class because I we don't have any classes. I don't want to miss one. But we'll probably end up having to start that session at 7 o'clock instead of 6 o'clock so that I can have time to get back to the hotel, get everything set up, and then do that session. So the session on the 21st will probably start at 7 instead of 6 o'clock. I mean, the 28th, I apologize. Session on the 28th, getting my dates mixed up, on the 28th, will start at 7 o'clock instead of 6 o'clock. But I'll remind you of that next week, and I'll also send out an email reminder to, uh, to just remind you of that later start date or start time. Okay? If you have any questions as you look at the midterm assessment, uh, feel free to shoot me an email. Uh, I, even though I'm going to be out of town part of next week and the week after that, I certainly will still be available by email and happy to respond to any questions that you might have. All right? Okay, everyone, I hope you have a good remainder of your week, and I'll have the recording up by tomorrow morning, and I hope you have a good week, good weekend, and we'll talk again then next Wednesday. So take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Powell. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.